Morning everyone, I'm Ewan Cameron, Curator of Botany here. And if you weren't aware of it, we're going to look at poisonous plants this morning. We'll start with this one. And this is one, if you brush against it, it'll sting you. Can you see those stinging hairs? This is the needle, this is the native nettle, this is the tree nettle. The oma oma. And it can grow several metres tall. And at least one person's died from it. Uh, running through a patch and didn't have many clothes on, so <laughs> exposed a lot of his body and paid the price. So why would a plant have cover itself in nasty stinging hairs? Is it been on the edge of the forest only uh, year? Usually, yes, in open, disturbed areas. Yeah. A bit, a bit bigger than your European one. We've got several native nettles in New Zealand. This is the biggest one. But there's also some nettles from Europe, smaller ones. And they like high nutrient, that's where they grow. Um, often the exotic ones are where um, cattle might um, congregate in farmers' fields where the cattle. Uh, congregate, you can find groups of nettles where it's high nitrogen. The interesting thing about New Zealand ones, the admiral butterflies eat them. So although this will be a defence, what would it be a defence for? Why do these plants have nettles, these stinging hairs? Why? To stop people from picking them? I think they developed before people came along and picked them. But it could be. But it could be something else, some other animal, perhaps. Yes. Stop them being eaten. Eaten by what? Native animals. Yeah, what sort of animal? Yes? Possums. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, um, mammals. Mammals, yeah. That would be the... So, nettles, the genus is found throughout the world, more or less. And so, animals that eat foliage, um, and those stinging hairs would quite quickly stop them trying to eat those. But the caterpillars of the admiral, they can eat them. And in fact, you can eat the leaves too if you, thanks very much, Robert. You can eat the leaves too if you cook them first. It uh, removes the, the stinging hair. So there's the species. Yeah, the mouse is probably dead. Okay. Yeah. And there's a close up of those stinging hairs. They are like little syringes, <coughs> and the toxin is under pressure. And when you bump against it, you break the tip, and then into your skin goes the toxin. And it's two compounds: it's a histamine and a acetylcholine. And that makes you feel very numb. Sometimes some of them are just numb for a few hours. Um, this big native tree nettle, you can have that numbness for almost up to a week. You don't want to get um, stung by it too severely. Which I'll just, I'll just go back because I was going to mention fungi, and those are two classic exotic ones, exotic foreign, not native, but found in New Zealand. So they come from overseas, not intentionally. In the old days, we didn't have the strict quarantine regulations we have today. So what people were allowed to bring living material, trees, wood, whatever, they weren't inspected. The mushrooms, toadstools have tiny little spores, so that's probably the way they came in. And how many of you have seen this big fly, Garrick? It can be that big? Red and white spots? No? No, it can be under pine trees. Yeah. yeah. In the autumn, most of them come up in the autumn, it's the fruiting body, it's like the flower of a flowering plant. Most of the year it's just living underground. The hyphae, fungal hyphae, you have nothing to recognise. And then in the autumn, when it's moist, still warm enough, up they come. And the spores drop out the, the gills and blow them around in the wind and disperse. Very common in New Zealand around pine trees. And this one, the death cap, same genus, Ammonita. That is very, very toxic. Both these are poisonous, but the upper one will probably make you sick rather than kill you. But that lower one will kill you. 
a teaspoon or two. So fungi aren't a thing to play with if you don't know what they are and you shouldn't eat them. And although this is very restricted where it grows in New Zealand, it does grow in the domain. That's one of the few sites it's known for. You know what these are? Seed shells. Seed shells, yep, they're pods of the kotai. Why have some got more seeds than others? Any idea? Because some have been pulled off. No, no, these never had seeds. Oh. It's to do with how it's pollinated. All the, the lobules weren't pollinated in those ones. So the ones with all the swollen pieces have been better pollinated. That's more what that's about. Do you know what pollinates a cocoa? No pollination in the air? No, it's an animal that does it. Do bees. Bees, not so much. Two bees are very good pollinators. Yeah, the two. two bees, yes. You've all seen two bees, haven't you? With their heads stuck into a cocoa flower. Mm -hmm. It's getting the nectar. The plant's very clever. So they give the bird a little reward. Nice sugary sap, nectar. And that gives it energy, and in return, it bangs its pollen on its, the bird's head. And when it goes to visit another flower, it takes the pollen from that flower and transfers it to the other one, and that grows into the ovary. And pollination occurs, and then a seed set. So inside these little chambers, so co-flies are the pea, and these are pods, just like the peas you eat, same family. And inside there, you got Whee. a yellow seed. They don't germinate for years, I guess. They're covered in this impervious seed coat, a very thick little coat, yeah. and they float in water. And one scientist in New Zealand put seeds in salt water to see how long they would stay viable for. And every year he takes a few out. He died last year, so I presume the experiment stopped. But he could still germinate seeds that have been in seawater for 10 years. So that's how strong that coat is. And that's what I was saying, the toxic part is inside there, it's the seed. But because it's covered in this coat, you could swallow it and it would come through and it would still be like that. But if you crunch it up in your teeth, then you'll get sick because then it can release it. If you want, to, if you, next time you're on the beach, walk along the high tide mark, there's not many beaches in New Zealand where you won't find some co fly seeds washed in. Take them home, and then with a very sharp knife, just nick the coat, cut the top off, not too much, then soak them in water, and then sow them, and they'll germinate straight away. No problem. What sow them as they are, and you can wait years. Say, what happens if you sow them? You have to wait for it to break down. For that down. seed's coat to break down, yeah, which could take years. We'll just do this as I've got things here. I mentioned the poro poro, the relative of the. Do you what it's the relative of? Tomato, potato. There it is. There's the poro poro. So here's the green fruit, just like your green tomatoes. And there it's just ripening up. This one's overripe, it's starting to rot. But they. They do go a nice yellowy orange when they're ripe. And the early settlers in New Zealand used to make a jam out of the poro poro fruit. So <clears throat> it's true in this family, the potato, tomato family. Thank you very much, Robert. That the green fruit are usually poisonous and the ripe fruit are edible. Wonderful. Thank you. So we'll go back to our nettle. And we saw those wonderful stinging hairs under pressure, waiting to punch into your skin. Okay, Karaka. Now this is a native tree. Big native tree with lovely... Here we are, can pass some along. Have a look. And smell the fruit. <laughs>
smell the fruit. So they have quite a nice sweet, sweet scent at this time of year. So we're very lucky, it's just the right time of year that we have the fruit. And you can see huge bunches of fruit. Now, Nari struggled in New Zealand to have enough fruit, enough uh, to eat. And this was one of the main plants that they actually planted for it, for food. Second only to the kumara. But the poisonous part of it is the kernel. It's the inside. So there's the, the fruit that I photographed us just on the weekend. So the fruit are lovely and ripe at the moment. What do you think's done there? Any idea? Red. Red. A bird? No, it wouldn't be a bird. A bird, I agree. And maybe rats, yes. Rats will do that. Pigeon won't do that, because this native pigeon, he swallows them whole. And then they come out the other end, but without the fleshy part. And by then it's flown quite a long way, and so it disperses the fruit, the seed of the karaka. Uh, this is probably blacklips, I suspect, but it could well be rats as well. It could climb long. Uh, ship rats are very arboreal. Is that, bird a wood that is a wood pigeon. That's the native kadaru. That's to remind me to tell you that they eat the whole fruit. And just because you see birds eating fruit doesn't mean that it's safe for you to eat fruit. Because we've got different enzymes and they can break down different chemicals, poisons, than we can. So some people say, oh, bird ate, so it must be alright. Well, that's not true. How do the marriage eat? Do they just eat them? Oh, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. So I just want to explain where the um, poisonous part is. <coughs> and so the, this is botanically it's called a drupe and a peach. A nectarine is a drupe. A drupe is a, a fruit with a different layers but a single seed inside. And these have a very woody uh, part that encloses the seed and inside is the seed or the kernel. And this fleshy part on the outside, um, you can eat, but the inside is very toxic. It affects the nervous system, <coughs> and the Māori, for people who did get poisoned that way, they convulse, and they used to bury them in sand, so they didn't damage themselves and leave their heads sticking out. Pretty horrific, isn't it? Okay, so... And this, this is what I just cut open the other day, and the seed isn't fully developed yet, the kernel inside there. But because there was so much fruit, even though it's toxic, the Maori devised a way of eating it, because they were so sh short of a food source like this. And they used to have to pre-treat it very extensively. They soaked it in water, they cooked it, they put it in their flax uh, bags, their kitty, into the streams and the running water, and they knew, and I presume once again this is what slaves are for, to how much pre-treatment you give it until it's safe to eat. And <clears throat> so this was a very important food source, even though it was poisonous. And they developed a way of detoxifying the fruit. Does it grow in the Pacific Islands? Uh... No, this is endemic to New Zealand. Um, there was a paper published by someone who said that the Maori probably yeah, brought it. That's right. Yeah. And that one publication has caused an absolute nightmare. It takes <laughs> about a hundred years to get something like that out of the literature. It's definitely endemic to New Zealand, probably taken by Maori to the Kumadex. We could cut some of these open. I've got a secretary there, so we can have a look. If that was just a bad one. Some fruit does develop slowly, the embryo grows slowly and so on. So let's do another one and see. No, it's full. Okay. So that was probably it's a bad photo, isn't it? Thank you for <laughs> correcting me there. So there we are, that's that would be much more normal. Oh, yes, yeah, so they would obviously only um, do the, the developed ones, yeah. But you saw those bunches of fruit in the earlier photograph. 
you can imagine a very easy food source when you knew how to handle it. Ah, now this is an oddball. This is what is called a wood rose. And it's caused by a parasitic flowering plant that has no green tissue, so it's 100% parasitic. There's, and that's actually this one, I think. So there's the Marina, poor old dear Manga, or flower of the underworld, Dactylanthus Tayloride. Right? That's what causes this. That isn't the parasite itself. Here's a lovely drawing by um, Arfi. So this is the host root, and this is where the flowering plant attacks it. And this is that mole that swim here, this part, that would be over this. And this is a host root. So this is the root of a, another tree. And the fungus attacks it and modifies its tissue. And what people used to do, and this is a threatened plant now, so hopefully people still aren't doing it, um, they'd dig up the root where the parasite was and they'd boil the root and the parasite boiling it removed the parasite and you're left with the modified host tissue. So the fungus, well, the flowering plant that is <coughs> where it attaches to the, the root of the flowering plant, it modifies the tissue and it looks like a, a wooden rose, hence the name wood rose. And every year it produces these flowers that come up, or their inflorescences, they are groups of flowers. And there's some photos I took down in Central North Island one Easter. Yes? Why is there a photo of a bear? That's to remind me to tell you something <laughs> about them. <coughs> <coughs> the, so see these mounds here? And these little uh, lumps coming up around the side are the groups of flowers. There's hundreds of flowers. There's just one there. Hundreds of flowers in the, each one. And some of them are male, like that one, and some are female, so separate male and female plants. And this is where the bat comes in. When it's flowering, a bat comes and gets the nectar, very rich nectar in there. And this little bat lands, crawls all over and sticks his head in and getting the nectar. Just like the tui and the kofi flowers, it pollinates the, this very rare plant. It's Dactylanthus, the flower of the underworld. The bat is a short tailed bat, that's a threatened species, and the parasite is a threatened flowering plant, a parasitic flowering plant. So, two highly threatened um, organisms. The, and this is the only ground plant known in the world that's pollinated by bats. And that doesn't surprise us, does it? Because New Zealand was pretty safe for small animals on the ground, like our flightless birds. They did, before this was caught on camera, they suspected it happened because bat poo had been analysed and they found dactylanthus pollen in the bat poo. And that's why they set up um, infrared is it? The cameras at night on the, on the flowers to see what was doing it. And then captured the little bats landing and sticking their heads in the flowers. And the guy who did that was Chris Eckroyd from Rotorua. And I saw him the next day after he'd seen that first footage. It was just incredible. The Poroporo we've already talked about, and I showed you some. I should, oh, this actually. <coughs> that's a bit of just going back to the wood rose. So that's the host root, and that's where all the um, parasite flower heads connect. Unfortunately, possums eat those flowers, so that's, and rats eat the flowers, so it's, this is another reason why it's so threatened. Okay, going back to Poroporo, and that's just a nice, beautiful purple flowers. It likes to grow in the open, disturbed areas. And then the Kofi, and the Tui, that's quite acrobatic, it sticks its head right up in the flowers. To get the nectar and so to spread the pollen, then the pods are formed and then the, the seeds are in each swelling. 
some better than others. So what's the pigeon on that picture for? That's to remind me to tell you <laughs> <laughs> that pigeons, thank you, eat the leaves. And wow. when Maori ate the pigeon after it had been feeding on kopai leaves, um, they got headache. <laughs> so the other part of kopai is a bit toxic as well. Great, even if my you get rid of that? Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, for my lunch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, where are we? Naya. This is a pretty widespread uh, native plant. A small tree, small a tall shrub. In fact, there's a part of Wellington named after it. The Naya, it's usually coastal. And it's very glam dotted. Actually, I've got a bit of Which makes my bit of Naya. There we are. That's a bit of Naya. And if you've got very good eyesight, or a hand lens, and you hold it up to the light, um, you might be able to see some glands in it, like little pale dots. Can you see it, those <coughs> little dots? Yeah. And that's where the oil is, and it's that oil that is called niobene, and that's the toxic part. So it's found in all parts of the plant. Um, livestock, a lot of livestock have been killed by this plant, cattle and sheep eating it. And Māori used it as a repellent, so they'd rub it on their bodies to ward off uh, mosquitoes and sand flies, the two worst pests in New Zealand, possibly. But then they also used it as an antidote when they had been bitten by mosquitoes and sand flies. And Tutu, this was the one we started on down in the poisonous itself. <coughs> Has the, you know, I haven't got a live one. It's very hard to find two two around the city. <coughs> it's those unusual veins. That's a dried one. You can see the, the veins run the same way as the midrib. It's unusual in a dicot. And there's the young flower spike. You can see it does produce a lot of fruit, and hence why Mary would have been interested in working out a way to eat it. And these wonderful photos by uh, Larry Jetson from Auckland University, can, we can see what happens here. The flowers are firstly female, so those are the styles sticking out, waiting for the pollen. Then the styles wither up, and in the same flowers, the Anthers appear, you can see the styles withering up in the centre, and produce the pollen. And that mechanism means that it can't self pollinate, it's not producing pollen while the styles are receptive to pollen. Then the pollen's dispersed, it's been pollinated, and the ovary starts to swell. The petals are still green at this stage, but over time, the petals swell up. And this is the only safe part of that plant that you've met. If you include that part there, it's got the seeds, it'll probably die. And the early settlers used to make a beer and they used to make a cake out of toot. And they were known to be killed because they forgot to remove the seeds or didn't realise the importance of removing the seeds. But an incredible food source for Māori, that they pioneered how to eat this. But I suppose, nice fleshy, you ate it, people died. Mm. Which part can we eat? Mm. Once again, <coughs> useful to have slaves. The oleander, the exotic plant that's commonly cultivated, but it's very poisonous. It has lovely coloured flowers, that's the main reason it's growing. And they can, the cultivars can be all sorts of colours. Uh, this one's a pink one, they can be white, they can be very bright pink. You know the plant? Those whirled petals. Uh, and as I mentioned in the gallery, just burning the clippings, breathing in the smoke can affect you. And <coughs> cooking sausages on the oleander sticks. If you're cooking bangers over the fire, know what you spare them on. Um, fortunately, it's 
it's very uh, better to taste, so people, children chewing it are unlikely to swallow it. <coughs> Hemlock. Hemlock has these wonderful see the stems on that we passed along. These blotched stems. It looks a bit like parsley, but it hasn't got a very nice smell. And parsley doesn't have blotched stems like that. And when it's fresh here, yeah, it's not it's not as bad as when it was fresh, it smells a bit like cat's piss. The, uh, the stems are hollow, this is an old one. And little boys particularly being known to use them as pea shooters and then get um, terrible sort of dermatitis in their mouths. So if you're using a pea shooter, don't use them lock. But there's the blotch stems and it grows, yeah, that part, these big white flower heads on it. And it's a common weed around Auckland. If you're going to choose a plant to kill someone, it's not the one I'd choose. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which one would you choose? <laughs> well, two obviously is a high on the contender list of being incredibly poisonous. Now, this tree is grown, and I can only find a young one, a nice old one at universities, don't know, obviously. <coughs> Um, now I won't pass this one around because some people will react just touching it. And it's a genetic thing, either you react or you don't. I think I don't. Uh, but you can come up with a terrible dermatitis just handling it. And people cutting the lawns, just brushing underneath the tree, can come up with terrible rashes. This is the Japanese wax tree. And it's grown for its red foliage. It used to be in the genus Rus. Now it's transferred into Toxicondendron, which gives you a clue that it might be toxic. And that's the same genus that poison ivy in America is a different species. And <coughs> this is the one when doctors ring and say, oh, I've got a patient who's got this terrible rash um, and doesn't know what caused it. I, this is the first time I've asked him, he's been near one of these usually the, the contender that causes the most trouble. It's still um, is sold around Auckland, but they do have labels that it may cause severe uh, skin rashes. And it naturalises. This was a, I couldn't see the adult, but I was passing Auckland Grammar, very virtuous, I was walking home last Friday, and not taking the car, and there I saw this lovely little um, seedling growing out of an old hole in the silver birch. So the, the fruit are small, about half a centimetre, and they look like little mangoes. It's in the mango family. And if you react to that family, you'll react to um, mangoes, you'll react to cashews as well. Just to finish up, so why, why have these plants got some nasty, nasty chemicals in Yes. To protect themselves. Okay. Good. That's the answer. The and some of these uh, the chemicals have occurred in the family overseas, and because the same pressure on New Zealand plants isn't the same because we don't have browsing mammals, for instance, they don't have to be poisonous to browsing mammals. But the things like the nettle have got defences for mammals. And that <coughs> would have come when the genus arrived in New Zealand, already equipped with it. That's the most likely explanation. Unless it was trying to ward off mowers, perhaps. And mowers, certainly some of our birds are foliage browsers. Yes, so it's a reaction to survival. And if you don't get eaten, then you're more likely to set seed and be successful. And if you do get eaten, you're... Uh, you don't pass on the genes so easily. So there's a strong selective pressure on reproduction. And so thank you very much. Now the, there is a poison centre in New Zealand, so if you, and that handles all poison, and it's got an 0800 number there, so anything 
you suspect someone's poisoned, that's the number to ring. There's a poisonous plant book, which is very good, and this includes New Zealand native plants, and this is an old edition, there's been two editions at least since this, by Henry Connor, it's really good, but it includes your garden plants as well as the New Zealand natives, so it's all inclusive. And this is a really nice uh, Māori healing and herbal by Riley. Not, this is obviously about the native plants and the chemicals and how Māori use them. A lot of um, quotes, you know, real um, information over time. It's, it's, it's very useful. And it's a good website and land care. Uh, just a couple of lines about the different plants that are poisonous, if you ingest them, not the ones, it won't include the ones <coughs> like nettle and Japanese wax tree that you'll react just by brushing against. That's the ones that you ingest. So thank you very much.